We're now going to turn our attention to dynamic economics, which is the study of economic activity over time. We're not going to be able to do a lot with dynamic economics in this course, but we'll, we'll be able to establish the basic tools that neoclassical economists use to think about trade-offs between the present and the future. To start out with, note that although the official title of this course is Intermediate Microeconomic Theory, this material wasn't always called Microeconomic Theory. In the 19th century in particular, what we've been doing this entire semester was called Price Theory. I may have mentioned this in the very first video that I did, the introduction to this course, namely that the reason it was called price theory is because we observe in the real economy that different things sell for different prices, and it's natural to ask, why do they sell for different prices? Why are some things cheap and other things expensive? And what we've been doing this semester is developing tools to answer that kind of question. Now, up until now, we've been only applying that to concrete physical commodities like the price of water, the price of fertilizer, and especially the price of corn. But what I'm going to ask you to consider now is the price of something which is an abstract commodity. It's not concrete. And in particular, it's something, it's a promise that's written on a sheet of paper. You can think of it as a contract. And the sheet of paper says, I owe you one dollar one year from now. Okay, this promise is called an IOU. And in English it's abbreviated with the letters, capital letters I, O, and U because when you read out those capital letters one by one, it sounds exactly like the words that you have on the left-hand side of the equal to sign. If I wrote these words on a sheet of paper and stood in front of a class and tried to sell it, presumably someone would give me some money for it. I don't know how much. In fact, the question of how much they'd be willing to give me is what we're trying to answer. But they'd be willing to, to give me some money for it. So in other words, this sheet of paper, this promise has a, has a value. And we'll call its value or its price. We'll denote it by the letter P. Or sometimes I'll refer to it as P dollars. The question then that we're going to pose is, what's P? How do we, what, what thought process do we go through in order to determine what P is? And the way we start is to model the fact that anybody who hears the offer to sell this IOU has two choices, to either buy the IOU or not buy it. And we're going to consider the uh, consequences of these two choices today and one year from now. The person who buys the IOU pays P dollars now. But we don't know what P is. P is the unknown that we're going to figure out. One year from now, the promise says that they're going to get a dollar. So they're going to get one dollar. Now we're going to assume that this indeed is definitely what happens, that a year from now you get a dollar. In the real world, just because you've gotten an IOU from somebody doesn't mean for sure that the promise is going to be kept. And there could be different reasons for the person not being able to keep the promise or or it could be reasons for the person not keeping the promise. They might not be able to keep the promise. Perhaps they've had a lot of financial misfortune and they can't give you a dollar a year from now. Or perhaps they 
died in the interim, and so they're not alive anymore, and certainly can't give you a dollar. Another possibility is that a year from now, they're not willing to give you a dollar. So in the real world, we wouldn't actually, uh, it wouldn't be correct to model this with definitely getting one dollar. Instead, we'd have to use a more sophisticated modeling setup with uncertainty, where we said, for example, there's a certain probability that you get a dollar, there's another probability that you only get 90 cents, another probability you only get 75 cents, another probability that you don't get anything at all. And so that would take into account the fact that you don't really know for sure that the promise is going to be kept. But for the purposes of our discussion now, we're going to ignore those possibilities. So we're assuming that the IOU actually is always honored. Okay, so that's what happens if you buy, you buy the IOU. What happens if you don't buy the IOU? Well, if you don't buy the IOU, you still got P dollars. You haven't spent it. And you'll do something else with it. Now, among the other things that you do with it, presumably you're maximizing utility and therefore the uh, marginal, well, I'll use a phrase I haven't used before in this class, the marginal utility of of that, um, those P dollars will be equal regardless of where you spend it in order to maximize utility. Now the reason I haven't used the term marginal utility is because technically marginal utility means that utility is cardinally measurable. That is, uh, you can measure exactly how happy a person is, like you know, their happiness level is equal to 5. And in this class we've only had to deal with ordinal utility, whether someone's happier or less happy, uh, whether a certain bundle is preferred to another bundle or not. And when you just use ordinal utility, uh, marginal utility never comes into it. Marginal utility is a cardinal concept. But the point is that um, if we assume that one of the things that you do is save money in a bank, then that's just as good as anything else that you're doing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. So that's what we're going to assume that the guy does with the P dollars. If he doesn't buy the IU, is that he puts the P dollars in a bank. We'll assume that the bank pays a rate of interest R, and so a year from now the bank balance, bank account balance, is the principal, namely P, times 1 plus r, where r is the interest rate. So for example, if the interest rate were 5%, then this would be p, sorry, p times 1 plus 0 0.05, so it would be p times 1.05. So that's an example with with 5% interest rate. To, to have a criterion that allows us to determine P, we're going to impose what's called the no regrets condition, which means the following. We're going to assume, and it's just an assumption, it might not be true in reality, we're going to assume that regardless of whether the person bought the IOU or didn't buy the IOU, they're equally happy a year from now. In other words, a year from now, the person who bought the IOU looks back and said, I made the right decision. And the people who didn't buy the IOU look back a year from now and say, I, might th I made the right decision. In other words, this no regrets condition that we're imposing is going to work in situations where people usually don't look back and regret the decisions that they made. If, on the other hand, they do, and frankly, in the real world, people often uh, do regret things, then this condition doesn't hold. The only way for the no regrets condition to hold is if the two outcomes, this one and this one, are the same those two outcomes are the same, then neither party would have any regrets.
And therefore, the no condition, no regrets uh, criterion implies that the outcome a year from now, if you buy the IOU, which is a dollar, must equal the outcome a year from now if you don't buy the IOU, which is P times 1 plus R. That then allows us easily to solve for P. And we get a fundamental equation, which that P is equal to 1 over 1 plus R. P is sometimes called the present value. of the IOU. So the present value of an IOU promising to pay one dollar one year from now is one divided by one plus r. For example, if r is equal to five percent and p equals one over one plus zero point zero five which is 1 over 1.05, which is certainly less than 1. In other words, what we predict is that the IOU promising to pay a dollar a year from now will go will have a price, or it's called present value, which is less than a dollar right now. And this is sometimes called discounting. Okay, so discounting is the idea that what happens in the future, a monetary value in the future is worth less than it is today. So a dollar in the future is worth less than it is today. Uh, I, I haven't calculated what 1 divided by 1.05 is, but the point is that it's uh, something close to 1, but it's less than 1. And that reflects, that reflects discounting which means taking the interest rate into account. Several questions now make themselves uh, kind of obvious. What happens if the IOU is IOU $10 one year from now, or $50 one year from now, or negative $3 one year from now? What happens if it's an IOU promising a dollar two years from now? What if it's an IOU promising five dollars in one year, negative two dollars the year after that, and positive four dollars seven years from now? So in other words, how would we calculate situations of more complicated IOUs? And that's what we do on the next video.